Hello, and thank you for joining us. I'm Kathleen Glenn Sparrow with the College Coaches, and I'm joined tonight by George Sparrow, who's our COO, and Damian Garcia, who is a head coach for us, the College Coaches, um, and Kelly Corey, who is director for Compass Education Group. So we really appreciate you joining us this Sunday night. Our plan is to talk to you a little bit about, about the college process and then shift over to the testing landscape and preparation. Uh, we aim to be done with presenting around 10 of eight and then open it up to Q&A. You are welcome to put questions in the chat and we're going to answer them at the end so that we can stay on point. All right, with that, I'll add, invite George to set our presentation overview. Great, and uh, definitely encourage people to give us questions through the chat. And uh, you are all uh, muted and videos off, but uh, we'll allow you to unmute yourself at the very end if you prefer to ask your question or uh, or be on video live with the rest of us. Um, so here's our agenda, um, unraveling college admissions. So this is a, a presentation that's focused on seniors and focused on kind of understanding the college admissions process. Uh, we're very importantly gonna give you um, a good number of action steps uh, for this summer. Uh, we'll go over a timeline for the applications and talk to you a lot about how to reduce stress, like a lot of kind of do's and don'ts. Um, and then talk also about visiting colleges and kind of how do you determine fit? What do you what do? You do what kind of questions do you ask? Uh, we'll talk briefly about demonstrating interest and why that's important. Um, and then we're going to turn it over to Kelly for the second half of the presentation. Uh, she'll probably be a little faster than us because she's a fast gal, but she's going to talk about the latest uh, changes in the testing landscape and test preparation. Uh, so who are the college coaches? Very briefly, obviously we coach high schoolers and their parents through the college application process uh, to deliver a winning outcome, right? Our phrase is because this is one game that you've got to win. So we provide a lot of strategic advice throughout the entire process uh, to really help make sure that there's nothing that you miss, there's no opportunities uh, that you miss or any missteps along the way because the college application process is incredibly competitive uh, we were just talking with some people this weekend at an event here uh, locally, and you know a lot of parents think, well, my kid's in the top 5% or the top 1% of their class, so they can go to a school that only admits 5% of their people, and he'll be fine, or she'll be fine. Um, but in fact, people applying to these selective colleges are all at the top of their class. Uh, so it's a, about more than just grades and more than just activities. Um, it's about getting that essay in the right place and putting together a narrative and again, kind of doing everything right along the way. Um, our business is uh, older than our clients, right? Older than high schoolers. Uh, Kathleen's been doing this since the year 2000. Uh, Damien's been doing this uh, uh, for a very long time as well, about 20 years. Uh, we have uh, nearly 100% five-star reviews. We did get a four-star review recently where a student said that they had to do a lot of work, but the advice was great. So we don't do the work for you, um, but we give you a lot of great advice. Um, we, we work to make sure that we find a school that's best suited to your interests, right? It's important that when you get to the school that you flourish there, right? That this isn't just the highest ranked school, but it aligns to your values and aligns to the program that you're most interested in. Um, so that again, you'll be really happy there. Um, all of this experience and all of the things that we do really significantly reduces the stress uh, on everyone so that we, we, we really hold your hand throughout. Uh, Kathleen, a few words about you. Sure. So thanks again for joining. I'm Kathleen Glenn Sparrow, uh, founder of the College Coaches. I've had the College Coaches for about 25 years and spent about that amount of time working in schools in the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area. Uh, some of the schools are listed here. Those roles included director of college counseling and English department chair. So uh, I love to talk to students about writing essays, and I also love to try to de-escalate the stress that's in the process. Um, I have counseled hundreds of families, but I learned mo the most from having my own two kids go through the process because of the stress involved. They have, everybody wants the same goal. We want a happy ending, but everyone approaches with different perspectives. Uh, my own educational background, I went to Duke University for undergraduate and majored in English and French, and my French is lousy, so I'm glad everyone's muted. No one can test me on that. Uh, and then I went on to Emory to get a master's in education. Um, I'd like to introduce Kelly and ask her to say a few words about herself. Yeah, great. Thanks. Um, 
I have been in the DC area and working with families on navigating test preparation uh, for um, almost 10 years now. I'm like at around, uh, yeah, about 10 years. So um, I've been with Compass as a director as at least as long as it took to grow my hair out uh, <laughs> from that photo. Mm -hmm. But um, a lot of what I do is is give the um, individualized advice that students are looking for to pick the right timeline, um, to really set specific goals for what their testing can contribute to their college planning, um, and to approach it with sanity and, and as limited stress as possible. So um, that's what a, a lot of what Kathleen and the coaches and I have in common and, and what we try to come together to bring to our families. Damian. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, good evening, folks. Thank you for joining us yet again. My name is Damian Garcia, and I'm one of the head coaches. Uh, a little bit about my experience in higher education, as George mentioned earlier. I have close to, not quite 20, but almost there, 20 years of experience. And as we say it in this business, sort of on both sides of the desk, I've spent about 11, 12 years on the college admission side at selective universities. Um, and you can see those universities listed there where I work. Uh, and I've been working on the independent school side and the high school side as well, uh, now directing and college sort of college counseling families and students to send those applications. So I've spent many years reading applications, reading essays, reading recommendation letters, and now working on the side that sends and helps the students and families uh, put together an application and send it off to the colleges. Uh, I really enjoy working with families and students in this process for sort of helping them be show the transparency of the process and helping them understand you know what's happening on the other end thank you guys so i'll continue with our talk and keep us moving and begin with a quick timeline for applying and we'll have a timeline for students and a timeline for parents so uh essentially for students you know a rough timeline of where you might be now as we're sort of wrapping up the end of our summer getting close and i know we all cringe at saying that uh, but in this point, this part of the process, in this part of the summer, you're you should have a a draft or a working draft of an essay. The first half uh, of August should be working on this essay. Um, the second half of August should be working on completing the common application or any application platform you might be uh, exposed to or considering for various schools. But Common App is by far the most uh, common application used uh, in the fall. You want to, you know, continue progress, continue reserving time and set aside time in the fall during September to work on writing supplements and other college related material. The fall is going to be cra more crazier than you think. Um, it's your last high school fall. It's your last fall dance. It's your last math high school class, right? So it's, it's a lot of celebrations. It's a lot of things that are gonna come at you during your fall of senior year that you wanna take part of, you wanna be engaged with, but you also wanna stay on top of the ball with the timeline for your college applications. Um, our recommendation is to, by September, I'm sorry, by October 30th, uh, right before Halloween, right on Halloween, make sure you submit that those applications or have an action plan to submit by then. Um, we want you to have a good Halloween, and not be too scared about what comes. For parents, we do have some suggestions and some timelines as well. Uh, you know, parents at the towards the end of August or middle of August, you want to begin making sure if you haven't done so already, if it hasn't been requested of you, to send in sort of your parent letter, brag sheet, survey form for your students to your counselor. I know often counselors are writing recommendations for students and they always appreciate any additional context from the house, from the parent to help inform their letter. So that's something you want to have to them at the start of the school year and if, if anything before then. Um, it's really helpful for parents to also take time to visit the net price calculator on college websites to begin looking at what the potential uh, financial picture looks like. And this is a conversation even with students um, that I work with, I encourage them to sometimes push back on, we'll talk about that later. We want, you want to have a conversation about that early on in the process so that there isn't a, a heartbreak happening at the end when you have admission decisions and then realize, oh, I thought you would have gotten 
X amount of scholarships and now I have to pay $90,000 a year or $70,000 a year. So you want to really have that fruitful conversation in August throughout the fall before applications are submitted so that um, you, you kind of address that head on. Uh, and as always, money matters. So there's consultations available with the college coaches in September to learn about the new FAFSA and what's going on there. So we do have some specialists on our team that are specialized in uh, FAFSA and keeps up to date with everything happening there. And we'll have some information to share about that. Okay, tips to reducing stress. I'm gonna continue on. Um, and the important thing is understanding the perspectives uh, will help sort of folks understand where things are coming from, where, where there might be stress related to this process. So for parents, you know, again, every parent and students have different perspectives. Parents are looking at the expense, the dollar sign, right? Um, and like I said, hopefully that conversation is happening sooner than later, but it's definitely a conversation uh, and, and piece to think about. Uh, parents might be looking at prestige. You know, you've worked hard, you've put your kid through the best programs uh, out there, uh, paid for, you know, great school, great housing. I, I'm, I'm a parent of some young kids and I'm thinking about it as well. So I, I know the conversations, I know the reasons why we move, why we live where we live. So uh, I know there's a conversation about prestige. Uh, validating those parenting years, right? Uh, kind of like what I just mentioned. You wanna make sure that all the things that we've done are, are, are working, are gonna set up our kids for success. Um, what kind of career can, can this college or can, can this college provide? What can the major provide as well? Uh, what kind of network, advising, uh, we don't want too much fun, right? We need you to be serious when you go to college and get things done and then get out of there in four years. Um, and, you know, sometimes we want to keep them close to home. So these may be parental uh, perspectives and parental priorities as we go through the process. What are the students thinking about? Well, let's put our, you know, our feet in their shoes for a second. Uh, students want to have fun. Students are looking for that freedom uh, that they may not have been accustomed to. It's a new game out there, new new world to them, uh, a cool roommate, uh, some new friends, right? They're excited to meet new people, new friends. These are what they're thinking about when they're visiting college campuses and looking at, looking around. They want to see, are these people I can hang with? Are these people who could be my friends? Uh, you know, location, you know, they're, they're some, some students may be really interested in a mountainous location, a campus that has access to the outdoors. Some students may be looking at campuses in the city uh, with access to a lot of urban opportunities, cool restaurants, fine, you know, uh, dining and things like that. Uh, concerts and sporting events, uh, good food, right? That comes up twice and a couple of times here, but, um, and potentially they want to be far from home, right? So again, putting your, putting your feet in their shoes for a second, what do they want? How are they looking at this process? And simply just understanding and knowing that these are the things that may be populating in their minds. And likewise for students in their parents' minds, you, we've got to come together and meet in the middle and give each other a little bit of grace. Yeah, I, I love that phrase, give give each other a little grace, Damien. I think a lot of the magic of what we do is bridging that gap, right? You've got 18 year old students who aren't always all at the same level of maturity. I know when I was 18, I probably wasn't in the best place to pick out my college, but it's important that they drive the process, but the parents you know, really want to shape it in the way that makes sense for them. And we really help to bridge that gap and again, reduce the friction between the two um, so that your child ends up being somewhere that they're gonna be very successful. Um, and it's not just, they didn't pick it based upon, you know, the, the the great food or the tour guide or anything that, you know, people sometimes pick colleges on. Right, absolutely. Uh, you know, reducing the friction is another way of saying, how do we reduce the stress? How do we take care of the stress? that happens with this process. And the way we view it and the way we've worked with families and we've expressed is that the best and the best way to deal with stress is to take action. Um, don't worry about it. You know, don't lose sleep about something. Ask the question, you know, reach out to your college coach here, e send us an email. Um, some of us are, you know, fine with texting. Send us a text if you're comfortable with that. To say, hey, I just heard this in the supermarket from a mom who was upset about the outcome of this kid. How, what does this mean? You know, don't sit and stew on things like that because there's a lot of information out there that could steer you in different directions. And we want to make sure we keep our head on straight and make sure you have the best information possible. Um, 
one of the things you'll find with the college coaches is that we have a variety of folks on our team that have over 40 years of experience visiting campuses, touring campuses. And that's one thing that we do specialize when you have a coach, you're getting sort of the full force of the team. Um, so we have a lot of information that we want to keep uh, on keep keep on top on top of for you. Um, so we'll give you that opportunity. Uh, and you know, one of the ways you know to to sort of alleviate some of the the stress from the dreaded question at family gatherings, at family outings. You know, you're a rising senior. You know, where are you applying? You know, I know you, you want to run away at times, right? When you hear that question, or you know that's going to come up. Um, the, 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 the tip here is to make sure, have a written or ready to go line and well -mean, for well-meaning and annoying family members, right? So what's your, what's your byline? What's a great, you know, one word, two word or phrase you can use? And an example here would be, you know, you know I have a great list of colleges. I will keep you posted, right? To, to sort of slip away from that moment of, feeling like you have to list off a name, uh, a bunch of schools, um, keep, keep them at bay. You know, I love the way this is phrased. I love, this is a great way. And I think you should use it. Um, I have a list of colleges. I will keep you posted and, <laughs> and hopefully, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, that's good. You're, you're on point. You're on time. Yeah. Uh, one of the other ways to sort of reduce stress during the process is to really you know, trim out, trim, set aside the time to talk about college and to not talk about college, right? It's just as important as well um, because we don't want to end up like this cat in the box here where, where, where you're just in, on no talking terms with anyone in the house because they're, they're bugging you about the process. So students can self-advocate, you know, by reserving the student lounge or other safe space at school that is free from college talk or, you know, put a sign up saying college talk free zone, whether it's in school or in your home, you can do that, right? Um, thank you, you know, for respecting the space, but creating those times, creating those opportunities and, and those spaces to talk, right? We don't need to have college talk at every dinner conversation, right? So there's a time and place for everything. So uh, I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Kathleen, to take it from here. And I love how I'm assigned to talk about the common mistakes. <laughs> But truth be told, these are mistakes that I made as a parent going through the process. So I want to share them with you so that you don't make the same mistakes. Uh, Damien just alluded to this. When my kids were applying to colleges, I took advantage of every moment with them, car ride to school, dinner, dog walk. And that was not the move. I was trying to be involved and supportive. Instead, I was suffocating them. So what we did in our house was we limited it. This is especially true for senior year fall when things start to ratchet up a little. Sundays at 2 p.m., the kids knew we were going to talk about college for half an hour. That kept me in line. I kept a list all week of what I wanted to ask them. And I tell you, at quarter of two every Sunday, I could hear little footsteps or big footsteps running upstairs to hurry up and do the things they knew I was going to ask about. Like, did you ask your teacher uh, to write your recommendation or did you let your teachers know you're going to be gone Friday for a college visit? So anyway, that's my number one mistake that you're not going to do. All right. The next thing I see often is not having a balanced list of colleges. And it's important when you come to this process as a parent, perhaps you're my age and you were in college 30 years ago, the process was a heck of a lot different then, right? Maybe we applied to three or four colleges. We certainly didn't categorize them. Um, and we probably didn't even know who our college counselor was, okay? Everyone knows me, I'm an influencer. I'm not, not yet. I'm working on it, working on it, just kidding. So needing to have a balanced list, two to three likely schools, that's the new term for safety, two to four reaches, and the rest can be more targets or likelies, okay? That idea is to maximize your happy choices in the end, right? Uh, so that's a mistake I see. People apply the dartboard approach, like the more colleges I apply to, the better chance I have getting in, which is actually not, not the right math. Um, okay, and then George hit on this in the very beginning. We all think our children are wonderful, and they are wonderful, but other people have wonderful children too. 
So that's just why we make a balanced list. It's not because your student is not competitive or fabulous. Indeed, they are. But we want to make sure that uh, they're going to have those happy choices. All right. Um, all your, all your, oh my goodness, I moved to Charleston and now I think I'm, I'm starting to have a little bit of a southern, southern twang there or something. I don't know. Each of you um, would have access to school data for your particular high school. Um, there are scattergrams that show how students from X school have fared at Bucknell, at McDaniel, at Middlebury over the years. Obviously, it's not going to have their name on it, but it will show a test score and a GPA. And it just gives you a sense of like, okay, wow, every year we seem to be getting tons of kids going from our school to UVA. That's awesome. Or wow, no one seems to be getting into Boston College from the school. I wonder what gives. It's just a data point. Keeping in mind that it's a data point and it reduces your student to two numbers, a GPA and a test score. Those scattergrams do not consider the essay, the academics in terms of the course rigor, the personality, interviews, teacher X, counselor rec, et cetera. Okay, uh, giving enough time to supplement. Some of you may not know what supplements are, and that's a wonderful thing because supplements are evil little additional essays that the college has asked for. They might be like the University of Maryland has, what was your favorite thing about last Tuesday? Or they might be something like a Georgetown in 850 words or less, tell us why you want to study business. Um, or 150 words on why do you want to go to our college. The reason why supplements are important is the colleges are looking at that to see, do you really know their school? Do you really want to go there? Why do they care? Because it impacts their yield. The higher colleges yield, that's the number of people who say yes to the acceptances, the better a college looks, and it's one of the uh, factors in the Stupid U.S. News and World Report rankings. That's going to be the name of our next seminar, Stupid Rankings. Okay, there's also another little evil thing called the SRAR, the Self-Reported Academic Record. Some colleges require this. I thought about putting a link into who requires it. You can just Google it. It's just a pain in the ear. Uh, you have to manually enter grades, and it takes about 40 minutes or longer. It's just something to be aware of. Your students will get an email about it, but we know they don't check email. So just mm -hmm. ask them to check if there's an SRAR. Okay, moving on. Visiting colleges, yes. I'm gonna breeze through this so that we can keep it rolling and give plenty of time for Kelly and time for questions. Some of these factors may seem obvious. I do wanna highlight two things. One is academic support. If your student right now is really benefiting from close relationships with teachers, from access to faculty for extra help, or maybe he, she, or they meets with a tutor, think about what is that gonna look like in college? Are we going to send our, our kid to college and take away all those supports at once? Maybe they're ready for that, or maybe a scaffolding approach would be better, where freshman year they have some supports in place, and as they grow and learn how they learn best, a few of the supports go down. But that's important because we want the student to do well. So academic support, I want to really, I really want you to consider. And then another one, location. For me, this was personal experience. Our daughter went to Duke, North Carolina, Maryland, easy drive, very accessible. Our son went to University of Miami. I don't know about you, but that's not a drive. So it just impacts the ease of visiting. And of course, my kids didn't want me to visit all the time, but there are some times when they might be able to use a little extra support. So those are the two things I wanna highlight there. Okay, how to find a good fit. You wanna visit a range of colleges and don't just visit the reaches. Yeah, super fun to visit reaches, but it's also really important. My rule, if you're gonna visit a reach or two, you're also visiting a likely or a target. We're balancing out, okay? Social media, online newspaper, and current students are outstanding up to the minute, um, you know, kind of insights into what's going on at the college. Keep in mind, though, when I'm referencing social media, I'm not referencing John, Julie, or Joaquin's Saturday night 
at College X. We're talking about the official college media, just saying that. Fisk Guide to College is the only book I use. It's updated every year. They talk to students about students. No, they don't. They talk to students about the college life and what's what's going on. Is the only thing we do on a Friday night play bingo or is the campus bringing in first run movies and speakers and all that. Last thing is the hardest, I think, for parents. Speaking for myself, for me, it was all about me. Oh, great, you're going to college. It's all about me, right? Uh, it's important to think this is the student's journey. You're in the passenger seat right now. Don't get out of the car. We want you helping, right? Students in the driver's seat, you're in the passenger seat. And if you have a, a counselor, a school counselor, or, or one of us, we're in the back seat, making sure uh, everybody gets along and gets to the destination. You want to talk about the image a teeny bit? I think there's two. Um, there. Clearly, George would like to talk about the image. So go ahead, George. Well, it's not just a silly meme. So uh, you I know, love silly you little in the right place. You do want to listen to your college counselor, right? You do not want to be comparing yourself to everyone else. That's a really quick way to stress yourself out. You don't want to be worrying about the kid who applied to 10 Ivy League schools and they had a great record and they didn't get in anywhere because they didn't have a good list. Um, and also, you, you want to realize that the fit is where you're going to be uh, happiest, right? It's not the hardest school you get into. It may be the best school that you get into in terms of your own fit where, you, where you'll, again, do well. All right. I'm going to go through these quickly also. These are kind of insider tips of what... Our team does, our team is all veteran educators, all veteran college counselors. So you can imagine if we've seen 200 schools, they all blend together. So this is what we do. Talk about, get the student newspaper, either online or in person, because it talks about the issues students are fired up about. Definitely try to meet the college rep who reads for your school when you're visiting. You just ask in admissions, hey, is the rep for Maryland or is the rep for New York here? Um, keeping some kind of notes. I know some students don't really want to do the old school journal. So take notes in your phone and pictures. It'll help you remember. And it'll help you with supplements because you want to add specificity. And if you can bring something up from your visit, that's awesome. All right. Go where the kids are, the cafeteria, the library, the student center. You need to go beyond the dog and pony show of the admissions talk. Okay. Get a feel for the campus. Just sit down and have a cup of coffee and watch the world go by. Are you energized? Do people seem connected? Does everyone seem strung out and miserable? What's the deal, right? Um, and then go get the local surroundings. Everybody asks me if this college has a Chipotle and how's the food. Listen, I'm not judging. I'm just telling you those are the things that the students mm -hmm. really care about. So check it out and try to have some fun in the trip. And eating in a, a student spot is really kind of a good way to do that. Um, somebody suggested this to me when I was going through the process and I thought they were crazy, but it was great. I went on a tour, my daughter went on the other <coughs> tour, tour guides, different questions came up in the group. We had different perspectives. We could compare notes at the end and we got a little space from each other, which I know she certainly valued. All right, and good fit. It's really important to get try to get it right the first time. Yes, you can transfer after a year for sure, but let's see if we can front load good research and good thinking so that we've got a happy, productive student in a good spot. You're putting a lot of money and time into this process and into the next four years, so you want to make sure um, you're researching it. It's it's like buying a house, right? It's, it's a big, big deal. Uh, we already talked about affordability and... Um, Last note there is fit is really a better um, connection to success for your child than than a st sticker on the back of a bumper car. All right, Damien, yeah. you're up. Yep, yep. I'll cover quick just a note about demonstrated interest. This is something that has sort of crept up in more conversations and been more prominent for some schools. Uh, demonstrated interest is essentially colleges and universities wanting to see how students engage with the university and they consider that in the admissions process. So it's a good question to ask the admissions officer or the event when you're visiting the campus or they're meeting with you at your school, hey, is demonstrated interest important in the application process? That's the question to ask. And some universities will say, yes, we value demonstrated interest. Some universities will say, nope, we don't care for it. Um, 
And, you know, demonstrated interest happens many ways. You go to book a tour on campus, you check in, make it an official visit. They know that you were there. Whether it's a virtual tour where you signed up for it as well, they can count that, right? Visiting your high school, they come to your school, they take attendance, they know that you've met with them during their visit. Uh, you register in places, maybe your school has Naviance or SCORE or Maya Learning, whatever platform you might be using. Uh, college fairs, if you have local college fairs in the area, it might be worth showing up and checking out the schools there. Um, attend local events, a lot of schools will be traveling in the fall, they spend enormous budgets to travel around the country, host events at uh, hotels, schools, uh, banquets, just to make sure they have a space and opportunity to talk to families and students and present. Um, and in some cases, your emails, you're, you're opening emails from colleges and some schools may be understand, maybe ca uh, counting those, those times you open an email and read their messages or clicking on links. Um, so that is a measure of demonstrated interest. And again, not every college is gonna keep this as a part of their application. In fact, some colleges will view this as an unfair sort of advantage um, because some people may not be able to demonstrate interest due to maybe geographic situation where you live and you may be resources. You may not be able to go to visit all the schools you want. So there's a balance there, but it's a good question to ask each college that you, you're engaged with so you can be prepared. So with that, I think George will, will turn it over to Kelly. Yeah, let's go ahead and send it over to Kelly, and um, we will um, uh, send send the recording of this out if anyone wants to share it with their friends. And we have an appendix here uh, that we'll flip through at the very end once Kelly's done for some additional resources. Um, we have lots of stuff on our website, so uh, we'd love to do a free introduction with anyone. Um, you can sign up for that on our website as well. So, Kelly, over to you. Thank you. All right, I'm just going to share my screen here um you know i i want to also keep the focus on um did that did that come up or we see in my yeah, okay, great. i also want to keep the focus on folks who are entering their senior year really in the thick of the application process even though i do start working with families on the earlier side as well like i know the coaches do occasionally too um but what i think is important for that is thinking about the landscape and how these tests are really uh being used in the admissions process so um, I also wanted to share our compass guide has all this information and way more. <laughs> so um, you're always welcome to request a copy of this. Uh, we have downloadable guides on our website, or you can ask us for a copy in the mail. It's about 100 pages, so please don't try to read it in one sitting and, and give yourself a stroke. Um, but if you have questions about testing, this book probably has the answers. Um, it will be shared, that link, along with my slides, too. So. Diving right into the testing landscape, part of what we're wondering is, okay, how are these tests being used? Um, you can see that there is this phenomenon happening called grade inflation. And this has been going on for some time, but really has been spiking in the last five years or so. So this is just tracking the GPAs of um, ACT takers. SAT takers, this gap is actually even wider. Um, so this is just showing that students who are applying to colleges with a 4.0 with an all A GPA, that is the most common GPA being reported to colleges since 2018. So, um, you know, this has just been a creep where over time, the most typical GPAs have kind of switched places. But if you compare that to the, the distribution of composite scores of testing, we're not seeing that same trend. Um, ACT and SAT, this is the ACT again, but the SAT falls under a very similar shape. They've more often been in the shape of a traditional bell curve. This has been consistent year over year, decade over decade. Um, what we've actually seen in the last five or six years is more of this shift to the left here. Um, part of that is from things like learning loss due to COVID. Um, it's also from things like uh, schools having more contracts with these testing companies to expose a higher volume of students to these college admissions tests than there were before. So while the grades being reported are higher than ever, the test scores have remained consistent, if not a little lower. So they're, um, they're sometimes called a common yardstick, which I don't think is an entirely appropriate term. But the point of a standardized test is that they are really good at creating this distribution of scores. It's not something that, um, you know, perfect knowledge equals perfect scores. They're really well-engineered exams. And that's why um, colleges like to have them as a 
point of context in addition to GPAs. Um, it's also worth noting, you know, not all GPAs, not all 4.0s are created equal. Um, I come from a big public school in Nebraska. Uh, I'm probably not going to be have my 4.0 stacking up the same way as an independent school in Maryland. So um, the test scores are just another way where it shows here we are exposed to the same material. Um, so this was the testing policy in 2019. So the pre-pandemic uh, scope was that SAT and ACT broadly required really a rite of passage for students who are applying to colleges. Um, there have been test optional schools for a long time um, or test flexible, but once the pandemic hit, there was this explosion of test optional offerings. And here's where we stand now. Um, the majority of schools are still test optional. And what that really just means is that they are considering an application complete with or without the inclusion of test scores. Um, some have returned to requirements. Um, these are led mainly by kind of what you'd expect, the highly competitive, some of the IVs, um, also large uh, state systems, particularly Southern systems, um, Tennessee, Florida, who have returned to requirements as well. Um, and then you're seeing also test free. So these are, these are schools um, primarily led by the UC system that won't consider a score. So even if you have them, they don't wanna see them, they're verboten, you know, don't even send it. Um, this spring, we have seen kind of a snowball effect of returning to requirements. And this is something that as seniors, you may have been maybe more keenly aware of in the headlines than, uh, than other students and parents. But it's kind of started with Dartmouth. Um, Dartmouth, uh, they released a study. A lot of schools have taken advantage of test optional policies since the pandemic to look at their own data and see how the success of students had been predicted by the presence or absence of test scores. So, um, you know, this is uh, Cyan Bylock who said, high school grades paired with standardized testing are the most reliable indicators for success at Dartmouth. And, you know, as Kathleen mentioned earlier, schools are concerned about yield. They're also concerned about retention, success, and graduation rates. So making sure that they are predicting success accurately for their um, admitted students is, is really at the core of what a lot of reasoning, a lot of these schools have put out as their reasoning. Um, shortly after this, Yale announced a test flexible policy. And I think Yale's test flexible policy is just testing required with a few extra words. Um, Yale is basically saying that first year applicants for, for fall of 2025, so your current seniors or rising seniors, can choose from four options of test. They can send an ACT or ACT, um, or they can send AP or IB scores. If you're choosing to submit AP or IB scores instead of SAT or ACT, you have to submit all of your AP or IB scores. If you're sending an ACT or SAT, you can choose which AP or IB scores to send along with it. Um, but when you think about applying to a place like Yale, it's most likely going to be an and, not an or, when you're that type of student. So I, that's why I say it's, it's kind of a requirement here. Right on the heels of that, we had Brown returning. Um, it was kind of a wave, same day UT Austin put back their requirements. Um, and the nice thing about these uh, kind of early reinstaters is that they were giving reasons. <laughs> the UT Austin, you know, showed the data that they had from students submitting their scores after admittance. Their non-submitter scores, they were, you know, a lot lower than the submitters were. And there was different um, levels of difficulty adjusting to the curriculum and different levels of success in terms of their first year GPA at UT Austin. All right, and then April was the most dramatic. So Harvard and Caltech both really quickly said, we're going to require the test scores for this fall. And what's interesting about this is that both of these schools had committed to policies remaining test optional for at least another year beyond this application cycle. So it's just a reminder to families that, you know, even when these, uh, these are supposedly planned policies, you know, they, there's nothing binding colleges to this. And so they will change their minds and they may indeed find a reason to follow this trend of back to requirement. So um, they're, they're in their own market and they're thinking about their own competition as well. And this seemed uh, like a really hard curveball for, for a lot of students, especially because by April, uh, many students, if they were gonna take their test may have started already. And so they find themselves re 
calibrating their goals and having to find time amidst all the things the college coaches have already talked about to maybe prepare for a test. So it's, it's a curveball that we, we haven't loved seeing. <laughs> um, yeah, Caltech had this up um, even through the day that they announced that they would require the policy again. Caltech will never consider your ACT or SAT scores. Um, don't send them. We will never see them. If your tests appear, they will be automatically suppressed. Same day, page not found. <laughs> So they really had to walk it back quickly. And um, I think we're not the only ones uh, disappointed that that we couldn't rely upon the policies as published. Um, Cornell is going to be reinstating. They made their announcement. It will not be for this year's applying class, but it will be for fall of 2026. So it's another one to watch. Um, and when you think about the schools that are even, even the ones that are supposedly test free, uh, look at the language of their policies, because you there may be a reason to have test scores available. Um, that, for example, you may need to provide your ACT or SAT score for certain other competitive scholarships. So, you know, maybe there's an opportunity to get significant financial aid if you have a score to submit alongside it. Um, Berkeley is a competitive campus, and even though they're part of the UC system that is test free, um, they will consider AP and IB exams. So they're, they're, they're still giving a hard no to ACT or SAT, but the number and, um, and scores of your APs are still going to be something they consider in your application. So be sure to take a look at the letter of these policies as well as the kind of label of them. These are both falling under the umbrella of test-free, but they're going to use tests for something. Um, and here's just some groupings we're keeping an eye on, schools that have not yet determined their uh, policies for the, the, the current classes, so the rising seniors, rising juniors. And as we know, you know, even if we think we know up through 2026, Harvard and Caltech have proved you don't really know till you know. Okay, so this is just... Um, Quickly, one of the students that I worked with, uh, actually, she was class of 2023. And um, when we were when we were making her testing goals, this was a list she was working with. So we were taking a look at what their policies were. At the time, overwhelmingly test optional, with the exception of Georgetown, who has always loved all kinds of tests. So um, the biggest question, I think, and this is something that students talk to their school counselors about, they talk to their college coach about. It's really about what to do with the score when you have one. Do we submit or do we not submit? So there's this is some language I stole from Grinnell because I think it covers broadly what a lot of schools will list as their recommendations. Um, the first bullet point, if you think your scores are an accurate representation of your ability, you should feel free to submit them. I think that doesn't really say much. Um, it's really hard as a student to see like, what does what is a score that is equivalent to my academic performance based on the rigor based on my school there is no concordance scale for that <laughs> there is no okay great i have a 3.8 at this school and that equals a you know 31 on the act that's there's no such thing so i think that's a bit of a silly one to think about um but if you get the score you hoped for especially if it's above average for our school submitting the score may help you that's some sound advice um even if your score is not above average for the school you're applying to, if it's above average for your high school, for your region, your neighborhood, it still may help you in the admissions process. And the last point too, um, a high SAT or ACT score can offset a low GPA. If you don't submit a score, there's less information about your academic performance. I think the final sentence there says it all, you know, there's data that could be provided, more information that you can give about yourself to the you know, speaking to the kind of student you're going to bring to this college's campus. Um, what I'll say about a test score offsetting a low GPA uh, is a phrase that I borrow from a colleague, but um, she says that uh, a, a high test score can heal the sick, but not revive the dead. So, you know, if there is something going on with your transcript and a high, uh, high test score can say, hey, look, I actually am really proficient in this area. I have the math skill, the verbal skill that's needed to be successful in my first year classes. Um, that's something that I think gives extra context to the grades that you're reporting. Other 
Other things to consider while you're making this decision. Take a look at the letter of the current policy. Get on schools' websites. Um, see what they are really saying. Um, take a look at what they did before the pandemic when many, many schools were requiring. Were they somebody who was test optional in the past too? Have they always been supportive of a very holistic review? Um, what is the duration of their current policy? Have they permanently adopted test optional? Um, have they extended it kind of year by year in increments? Are they waiting for their right moment to go back to requiring? Um, and if they share it, see it, what uh, the, the admit rate of the overall applicant pool has been for non-submitters and submitters. Um, I think there was more transparency for this in the first few years of the pandemic, but some schools are still making these numbers available. Um, and yeah, just, just what you can find as far as the submit rate overall for the applicant pool. Um, that I think is is most relevant for seniors. There's a couple of things I want to talk about of you know how this process is usually navigated. So if you happen to be a student who's still thinking about taking a test, um, the most important first step is choosing. Uh, I'm not gonna I'm gonna blaze through these slides because I do want to preserve time for Q and A. But overall, what we're looking at here is um, a digital SAT which debuted this year. So it's a uh, Two sections still, math and verbal, but each section has two stages. And so students are directed on different pathways based on their performance. And it's ended up making it a pretty student-friendly test. It's shortened the overall length of the exam. Students are getting to their scaled scores more efficiently. Um, they like the digital format. Um, this is what it might look like as far as the range of difficulty of questions on a, quote, easier path versus a path with more difficulty, you're still getting a lot of the same mix of questions. It's just about calibrating where you're falling on the scale. Um, ACT is staying its course for now. Um, if you are somebody who is a nerd like me and sees all these education headlines, ACT has announced changes to their test that will come in April of 2025. Um, if you're a parent of somebody who is a rising sophomore or younger, this is likely to impact your student. Um, but if you're not, I do think the ACT in its current format is um, is kind of here to stay for any students who might be testing between now and next summer. Um, but yeah, so it's still a paper and pencil test, um, except with the exception of pilot sites. Um, it's still linear, so non-adaptive. And it has a science section, which is not present on the SAT. So those are the biggest uh, the biggest differences. There's still an optional essay. Nobody wants it. Nobody needs it. It's not the best writing a student's going to do. So um, if you are registering for an ACT, please skip it. And, you know, I invite you to never think about it again. Great. Um, so this is a little bit more of a breakdown of the tests. I don't think we should play too much with this. Um, testing schedule, it's usually, like I said, it's usually, um, it's going to start sooner than senior year. So when you have a Harvard or a Caltech derailing that timeline, it looks different and students often need a more individualized plan. Most students will choose their tests sometime in the fall of 11th grade. And then over winter break, they might make a plan for what prep looks like and actually tackle the preparation in the spring. So this was my Sally student uh, sample earlier. She took her first test in May. Um, with the way that tutoring works with Compass, the kind of golden ratio here is one lesson a week one practice test a month, spread it out over a couple months to your first exam. Uh, we work on a one-on-one -on -one basis with students. We work online in group classes. So um, some students mix and match. We just, we consider this industry like a bit of a buffet and, and just like with colleges, the perfect fit is not the same for everyone. So feel free to uh, have a conversation with me about what makes sense for your student. Um, yeah, so this is really what test prep is about. I mentioned before, it's not all content knowledge. If you had perfect knowledge of the test, you'd still not get a perfect score, you know, nine times out of 10. Um, there are strategies that will help you be successful, but it's also about emotional control, um, having some sense of how to approach the test, how to respond to the anxiety and the stress that comes along with what feels like a very high stakes moment for students. Um, and time management, of course, the the restrictions of timing on the test are part of what puts students under duress. So that's what we're aiming to diffuse. <laughs> I'm just gonna skip through this. Yeah, so taking the official test, submitting the scores. This is I'm gonna go back to Sally's student because this is just uh, uh, how we wrapped up her process. So um, 
the goal that she set for the school she was looking at was a 1450. Now, this was a really lofty goal because her practice test score was around a 1220. So she was looking for a gain of about 230 points. Um, over the course of her test prep, she took practice tests to get ready and rehearse this process. And you saw some really nice growth over the course of those tests. When she actually sat for the test in May, she got a 1400, which was really exceptional up 180 points from her first practice test. So um, we talked about that result. And ultimately she decided that she was really happy with the math score, felt like it was the best she was gonna pull out, but thought there were points on the table for verbal. So we got a few review lessons with her tutor, focused on the verbal. She took the test again and got it raised up to a 690. Um, based on super scoring, which combines the, the top section scores, she got a 1440. So goal of 1450, got a 1440. Um, she was very proud of the result. And these are the ranges of the, of the reported scores for the mid 50th percentile of the schools on her list. This was something that put her in the range of all of them, a little bit under Boston College, but she was really proud of the result. So she went ahead and sent it to Boston College anyway. She decided I'm gonna submit it everywhere. I think it's gonna add to my, my uh, overall application. And she got into Boston College, and that's where she decided to go. Um, I also did want to mention again, you know, what came up in the language of the uh, the test-free school that uses scores for merit aid consideration. Test scores can yield a lot of returns in terms of merit aid. They may be they may have different thresholds for students who apply to the scholarship with a test or without a test. Um, so there's this blog is something my colleague put together, and I'm I'm happy to share that in the resources as well of different um, different scholarships tied to different schools. Okay, um, I'm pretty sure that's it from me. Uh, but yeah, that's to wrap it all up. You can uh, consult. You can also schedule a free consultation with me or another director on our team. Um, we do proctored practice tests online or in person in the DMV area. Um, we do one-on-one -on -one for, for SAT, ACT, PSAT. We do group classes, APs, and academic tutoring. So um, the contact information for me and my colleague, who are your local DMV folks, are, are here. And we'll make sure that, um, that you get that with the follow-up information from the college coaches, too. Thank you, Kelly. Awesome. And we are going to stay on and invite participants uh, to unmute. And you can feel free to share your video if you like. And if you have any questions, you can either put the question in the chat um, or you can raise your Zoom hand or speak out, whatever you'd like to do. And just as a quick note, I, I will send people this slide in the next uh, few uh, so we won't talk through them. But um, please send your questions via chat or you can go ahead and unmute. We are ready. Oh, raise hand even better. Uh, Leah, let's hear it. Um, yes, just so you know, it looks like the chat is turned off. Mine says chat turned off by host. So maybe that might be why you don't have questions, just FYI. Oh, uh, thank you. That is good to know. Okay. Um, in going through the process, we've already started to look at schools and application deadlines. But if a school doesn't explicitly say that an essay is required, are you to assume that it's not? I can tell Damien wants this one and I'd like him to take well, it because he has direct sure. admissions office experience. Sure. Yes, thanks. Great question, Leah. Um, on the common application where most schools subscribe to, it clearly will indicate whether a college requires an essay or not. Um, the colleges that do not require an essay are far fewer than those that do. Um, so it will be obvious throughout in the application process and, and when writing the Common App. And oftentimes on their admission website, they will have the section that says application requirements. And quickly on there, it will state um, essay, interview, you know, high school transcript, things like that um, on there. So you can find it there as well. But if a student is using the Common Application or any other application platform, usually the essay is part of it. And if it's not required, it will not be for that school. I hope that helps. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Great, I did see that chat seems to be back on. So hopefully folks have that option as well. Well, 
is there more questions in chat? Yeah, to here's it another. Else was, uh, I'll read the my screen, question I? here. Okay. Any recommendation letters? Are recommendation letters a thing anymore? If your child has a close grade reference, is there a way to submit? Um, I can I can take that one. Um, yes, recommendations are still a thing. Um, Colleges are very interested in having at least one or sometimes two teacher recommendations. Uh, and the teachers should be in subjects that are core subjects, uh, like no offense to ceramics, uh, but it needs to be kind of a math, science, world language, something like that. The school, the high school will also submit a counselor recommendation letter. And if you have the opportunity, a lot of schools invite uh, invite parents to submit what's called a brag letter or a parent letter that talks about your child. The school college counselor usually takes that great information um, and puts it into the counselor rec letter. If you have an outside letter, like maybe from a, or an outside recommender, like a coach or a job supervisor, that's something to think about and maybe discuss um, with your school counselor or with the college coach. What's the best strategy there? Should we save that in case the student gets deferred somewhere? Deferred means we're not going to take you right now. We're going to look at your application again later. Or should we have that recommender send it directly to the school so it doesn't get lost in the shuffle of the school sitting, submitting all the applications? So yes, recommendations are important. And the last thing I'll say on that is it's the teacher should be, the teacher whom the student selects should be the teacher that knows the student best in terms of can he, she, or they write about the student as a student Bonus, if they can talk about the student's character. Um, you might get some teachers who ask for the student's resume, and you can feel free to throw me under the bus. I spend a lot of time under the bus, especially with my own kids. Um, and you can say, oh, I heard this college counselor say the teacher letter is supposed to focus on that student in the classroom because the counselor letter is going to talk about the resume activities, and those are going to be repeated on the application, too. So that was a very long answer. Um, I'll be quiet now. I'll drink water, so I have to be quiet. Another question came in. Um, what are some tips on creating a strong brag sheet about yourself? Definitely. Yes, as yeah, sure. As as someone who definitely looks at brag sheets and relies on them for some good information, um, you know, anecdotal. Uh, evidence, right? We, we like evidence-based information. So, you know, a story that captures the essence of who your student or child is, um, you know, examples of things they are responsible for at home and things that they do. Um, and again, keeping this somewhat in in, ref in view of the last three to four years is, is also good. We don't, we don't quite need to know how they conquered the tire swing in uh, second grade. Uh, you know, that that's not super helpful and super relevant, um, but maybe it speaks to the spirit uh, of, of perseverance. Um, but we certainly want to see in those brag sheets uh, more recent anecdotes of, of, of you know, uh, accomplishments, achievements, you know, who the student is at home um, in, in their community, um, what role do they play in the family? Those are important pieces to help us fit the entire picture together. Um, speaking from, again, the school counseling uh, or the college counselor perspective that's going to be writing for them. There's a question in the chat. Should students also be using Naviance? Yes, we talked about um, a little bit earlier in the call, Naviance or SCORE, or Meyer Learning, whatever your school's college counseling software is, students actually have to be on it because that is how the, the school college counselor is going to see the student's list and actually upload the teacher recommendations, transcript, and send those materials to counselors, excuse me, to colleges. So typically the parents will have a login and the students will have a login. All right, any other questions? 
Y'all can chat, you can unmute, you can even, we might even let you show your video. <laughs> well, we saw a brave, brave Leah. So, okay. If there are no further questions, look at that eight o'clock right on the dot. Uh, we certainly appreciate you taking time out of your busy lives to join us tonight. If you have any further questions, you know how to reach us and we'll send out a copy of the recording. Um, and my, uh, maybe I'll ask each of us just in closing to give one last, one last piece of advice uh, for those parents who may be uh, going through the college process at this point. Um, Maybe. Sure. Uh, yeah, I can give you a second uh, as I kind of give my tip and advice. Um, you know, really enjoy this process. It's a process that you get to be uh, in unity or in union with your child um, as, a, as a family visiting, you know, traveling, visiting, touring colleges together. It can be fun. It, it should be fun. It shouldn't be anything but fun and exciting. So if there is if there's ever an air of man, this is becoming too much or stressful, really step back and let's think about why we're doing what we're doing. Kelly? Yeah, I would, I would say very similarly, you know, be on the same team. Um, my, my biggest thing that I also uh, say to families is, is, you know, the perspective I like to provide is being protective of time. Time is something that you're not getting back. <laughs> And whether that's the time you invest in something like test prep, the time you dedicate to the conversations about college, um, you know, time is time is a precious resource. So uh, be mindful of, of what you're doing with it and the return on investment you hope to get. Um, and yeah, just stay in alignment on the fact that we all want the best for the student. Absolutely. George, do you have a piece of advice? Are you going to let me speak? <laughs> all right. Um, I would just say very simply, you know, we, we, we turn in fantastic results every year. We've got a lot of our current clients who are on this call listening in for a little extra info. Um, we've got 97% recommendation rate and you do yourself a great service by uh, signing up for a free intro on our website. Uh, we give a lot of good free advice on that free intro specific to your family. Uh, it's 30 minutes, uh, 45 if you got good questions. Uh, so we'd love to see you again. Kathleen. All right. My last piece will be, let's see, I have a lot, a lot of lessons learned. I'll, I'll make it quick. I would say uh, put family first and try to think about what you do well together as a family. Is it go to a movie where you guys are together, but it's not a, a dialogue? Is it taking the dog for a walk at the dog park and just some kind of release? Still keep those uh, traditions going because the seniors, they've got one foot at home, one foot stepping out the door, and there's a lot of emotions involved. So just try to keep some normality and some uh, some family traditions going or start a new one. All right. We'll stop giving advice that you didn't ask for in the first place. Uh, but again, thanks so much. Take care and uh, best of luck to everybody in the process. Thanks. Thank you.